Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam chose leaders for his expeditions, he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam chose, chose people who were qualified. It was based on qualifications. Among the serial leaders of expeditions deputed by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to lead these expeditions, we are going to find Sayyidina Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu as one of those repetitive leaders. He led about maybe at least nine of the expeditions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sayyidina Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu was so beloved to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he treated them initially, if you remember, he was adopt, the adopted son of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and after adoption was abolished, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam still loved him so much, more probably than most of the companions. Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha used to say that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved Sayyidina Zayd more than he loved any other companion. And if Sayyidina Zayd radiallahu anhu had survived the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if he lived after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away, probably the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would have nominated him as the leader, the Khalifa of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That was the love that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had for Sayyidina Zayd. Sayyidina Zayd radiallahu anhu, for those who do not know, was relatively thin, small in his uh, body. He was dark skinned, very dark skinned actually, as many people say, he was, they describe him as extremely dark in his skin, like Africans. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved him, as I said, loved him so much. Sayyidina Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, another great companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was about 10 years older than Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu, his brother, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. And Sayyidina Ja'far, as we mentioned before, was the leader of the delegation of immigrants in Al-Habasha. And he stayed in Al-Habasha for almost 13, 14 years. He had just joined the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in, uh, in, his, in Medina, actually he joined him when he was in Khaybar, when the Prophet ﷺ was in the battle of Khaybar. And as we mentioned, the Prophet ﷺ said his famous words, Wallahi ma adri bi ma usar akthar Khaybar am bi Ja'far. I don't know which one to celebrate more, the conquest of Khaybar or the arrival of Ja'far and joining us as part of our family in Al Madina Al Munawwara. So the Prophet وسلم, loved him also so much and he told him that you resemble me so much. On the way back from Umrah Al-Qada that we talked about last time, a young girl came rushing to the Prophet وسلم, saying, Ya Ammi, Ya Ammi, O oh, Uncle, O oh, Uncle. And that young girl was Umama, the daughter of Sayyidina Hamza radiallahu anhu. Sayyidina Hamza, of course, the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who was martyred in al Madina al munawwara she was kept back in Mecca and she grew up uh, in Mecca. She was maybe about 10, 11 years old, maybe a little bit younger than that. And she came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, saying, Ya Ammi, Ya Ammi. She could have called him my uh, cousin because he was sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He was her cousin, not her uncle. But out of the difference in age, and out of respect, she called him uncle and not cousin. And the companion said, we should not leave her behind to be raised among the idol worshippers. We should take her with us to al Madina al Munawwar. At the beginning of Islam, the Prophet wasallam made this brotherhood between the Muhajireen in Mecca. And then later on, there was another round of brotherhood in al Madina al munawwara between the Muhajireen and the Ansar. So in Mecca al mukarramah the Prophet ﷺ made these brotherhoods. The brother of the Prophet ﷺ in this case was Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu. The brother of Sayyidina Hamza radiallahu anhu was Sayyidina Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu. So now when this young girl came to join the Prophet ﷺ, who's going to be her custodian, who's going to take care of her, three men stepped forward. 
each one claiming, I am more fit to take care of this young orphan. The first one was Sayyidina Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu. He said, well, Hamza was my brother and this is my niece, so I should take care of her. He has a point. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu said, she, she came rushing to me. She ran to me first. And my wife, Fatima, Sayyida Fatima radiallahu anha, we can raise her in our household as a young sister or as a daughter. And Sayyidina Ja'far radiallahu anhu said, well, she is, her father is my cousin and her aunt, her maternal aunt is my wife. So who is going to care for her better than her aunt? So each one of the three had a case to present to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told Sayyidina Zayd, told Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu, you are my brother. Told Sayyidina Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu, you are my ally. And told Sayyidina Ja'far radiallahu anhu, you are the one who most resembles me in appearance and in manners. So he praised all three of them. But at the end he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, an aunt is like a mother. So, Asma' bint Umais radiallahu anha, the wife of Sayyidina Ja'far radiallahu anhu, is going to be the one who's going to take care of this young child. So he gave her to Sayyidina Ja'far radiallahu anhu to be raised at his own house. We find the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sending different campaigns to the different tribes of the Arabs who have not embraced Islam yet. Again, first of all, to make them stop their aggression against Medina and to invite them to Islam at the same time. Who did he dominate as the leaders of these campaigns? We find one of the campaigns led by Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Very dangerous campaign led by, led by Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Another dangerous campaign led by Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu. A third similar campaign led by Sayyidina Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu. So basically the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa did not keep his companions in uh, al madinah al Nawara in safe protection, but again, to, to lead by example, if he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not lead the expedition by himself sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would nominate a leader who was very close to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to show that we are leading by example. We are not exposing people to danger unnecessarily and I'm not sparing any one of my companions. They are going to be exposed to any uh, peril or any danger just like anyone else and even like myself sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so we find again here the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, sending these different leaders to these different expeditions among the newcomers also to al madina al munawwara as we mentioned a few times ago after hudaybiyah there were two actually three passengers who came from madina among them, two of the leaders, two of the leaders of uh, Mecca al-Mukarrama. And these were Sayyidina Khalid ibn walid radiallahu anhu and Sayyidina Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu. When they approach, and the third one, of course, was uh, his name is going to come to me in a moment, inshallah. I know exactly who he is, but uh, his name is going to come to me. Uthman ibn Abi Talha radiallahu anhu. That was the third one. So the three of them made up their mind, it's time to join the Prophet ﷺ. The truth has become clear, so it's time to join the Prophet ﷺ in al Madina al-Munawwara. When they approached al Madina, a young man saw them approaching and he recognized two of them, Sayyidina Khalid al-Walid and Sayyidina Amr ibn As, which, who were very prominent people. Of course, Uthman ibn Abi Talha was also very prominent because he was the custodian of the keys to al kaaba But still, uh, he, the, the man recognized them and he, he was heard saying that Quraysh cannot defeat the Prophet ﷺ after these two have joined him. Talking about Sayyidina Khalid and Sayyidina Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhumah. So everyone knew who these two individuals were. 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent, when he sent an expedition led by Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he wanted to involve these new companions in the business of Medina. So he sent Sayyidina Khalid radiallahu anhu as a soldier in the army of Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, as a training camp. It's not a military training camp for Sayyidina Khalid because Sayyidina Khalid is the military genius, but it's a, a training camp in obedience because Sayyidina Khalid was always a leader. Now it's his time to be a follower and a follower to whom? To Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So all of these, these were continuous training camps. When we look at the expeditions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we, we would find that it's almost every month, maybe every 40 days at the maximum, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would send an expedition either for exploration or to respond to a certain threat or to repel a certain uh, potential threat or something like that. So it was always a very active uh, life and the Prophet Sallallahu showed them don't settle to this earth too much because again life is too short to settle to this earth and feel too comfortable. We have a responsibility to do. In one of uh, the battles of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we find a new delegation coming to join and that's a delegation from al Ashairah from Yemen. These were people who actually have embraced Islam a long time ago, but the Prophet وسلم, when they embraced Islam, like Sayyidina Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu, their leader, the Prophet وسلم, told him, don't join me yet in al Madina al-Munawwara. It's too dangerous. Wait until things settle and then I'm going to call for you to join. So now the delegation from al-Yaman came and including Sayyidina Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhu, whose real name was Abdullah ibn Qais, and another man, Abdullah ibn Sakhr, known as Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, from the tribe of Daus, he also came with that delegation and joined the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So now they are exposed to this training and they went on the expedition with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the battle named that al riqaa that the, Riqa basically is some, some of the scholars of Sira uh, have different opinions on when exactly did it happen. Some of them say it happened around the fourth year of Hijrah and some of, they, some of them, which is probably more authentic, say, say that it happened around the seventh, the end of the seventh year of Hijrah because Sayyidina Abu Musa al-Ash'ari is the one who narrates the hadith about this battle and he was not there in the third or the fourth years of Hijrah. So he narrates that it was a very uh, long journey and it was called Dat al Riqa. Uh, their footwear wore out out of walking in the hot sand of the desert in Mecca and they had to wrap their feet into pieces of cloth that they tore from their garments. It was a long and arduous journey, but again, it was full of lessons and blessings and miracles of the Prophet. To unite this army and to bring them to the fold of the new of, of the state of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in uh, Al Madinah al Munawwara. Remember, we talked about Al Harith ibn Umayr radiallahu anhu, the messenger of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who was killed by uh, the Ghassasina by Shurahbil uh, uh, al al Ghassani, Shurahbil ibn Amr al Ghassani, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did not like that. This is an insult to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and this is a bad sign because if other tribes followed the same practice of killing the messengers of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the majesty of that state and the respect for that state will go away. No one will care about the state. No one was going to have any awe from that state anymore. So now the Prophet wasallam, and we are about the, the beginnings of the eighth year of the Hijrah of the Prophet wasallam, the Prophet wasallam, prepared an army to go and avenge the killing of his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who was in this army? 
the army was led by Sayyidina Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu. No surprise there. Because again, he was nominated as the leader so many times. But for the first time now, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam nominated a second leader. And then he nominated also a third leader. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the leader of this delegation is Zayd ibn Haritha. If he's injured or killed or incapacitated, the leader becomes Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. If he's killed or injured or incapacitated, the leader would be Abdullah ibn Rawaha, radiallahu anhum ajma'in. Let's look at these three names. Sayyidina Zayd ibn Haritha, radiallahu anhu, as we just mentioned, the very close companions and the beloved one by the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, known as Hibbu Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the beloved one to the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sayyidina Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, the beloved cousin of the Prophet وسلم, that he described as Ashbahta Khalqi wa Khuluqi, you resemble me in your appearance and in your manners. The one who has been away for 13 or 14 years and just joined less than a year ago and now the Prophet وسلم, is putting him in harm's way. Because again, these Ghasasina are on the border with the Roman Empire and they are allies of the Roman and agents of the Roman Empire. So any aggression against them is also going to be an aggression against the Roman Empire with all of its might. The third one, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiallahu anhu, if we go back 10 years earlier, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Rawaha was one of the Nuqaba in Bay'at al-Aqaba al-Thaniya, one of the 12 delegates of Yathrib that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam pledged to or shook hands with as the representatives of the community of Medina. So he, again, he had a, a very important role and status in the history of Islam. So these were the three nominated leaders. And again, it is for the very first time ever and probably the last time that the Prophet wasallam nominated three leaders, consecutive leaders, to the same army. And that army was about 3,000 warriors. Now we can see the progression in numbers. This is an army of 3,000. The Muslims defending Medina in Ghazwat al-Ahzab were about 3,000. The, the Muslims going with the Prophet وسلم, in Hudaybiyah were about 1,400. So we can see that in the folds of less than two years now, the number of, of Muslims is increasing, whether it's delegations coming from Yemen, whether it's people coming from Asham, whether it's people seeing the end result that Quraysh sooner or later is going to be defeated, so they rush to the support of the Prophet وسلم, like Sayyidina Khalid ibn Walid, Sayyidina Abd ibn Az, and so on. So we can see the number of Muslims increasing, and this is basically what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the reasons Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called the truce of Hudaybiyah fathan mubinan, because it's going to result in a dramatic increase of Muslims in a very short period of time and as we're going to talk about maybe next time or the time after that about the, uh, the surrender of Mecca ultimately. So now this army, 3,000 people led by these three companions. Sayyidina Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu he is the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is from Bani Hashim. He is from the prominent family, the leaders of Mecca al mukarrama and so on. And he felt in his heart, Oh, Rasulullah, are you going to nominate a former slave as my leader? Zayd ibn Haritha is going to be my leader. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told, told him, Sayyidina Ja'far radiallahu anhu, you never know what is best. I am telling you this is the best. Before that army left uh, al Madinah al-Munawwara and what was expected is that they're going to face the Ghassasina, which was almost not exactly equivalent in number, but it's, it's much more numerous than the 3,000. But again, it's not facing the, the huge army of the Roman Empire itself. And it's, it's a long journey between al Madinah and Munawwara and what is now Jordan, because the battle happened in a city or a town called Mu'ta, which is what's in, in what's now Jordan. So it was a long trip in a very harsh terrain and a, a long distance to travel while their enemy was settled in that land. 
So before leaving this Al Madina Al Munawwara, it was on a, on a Friday morning, uh, one of the Jewish settlers in Medina came to Sayyidina Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu telling him, if this man claims to be a prophet, talking about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa if this man claims to be a prophet, let me tell you what the prophets used to do. In our books, meaning in the Torah, in our books, it never happened that a prophet nominated more than one leader for the army, except that all of these leaders would die. As if he's threatening Sayyidina Zayd radiallahu anhu. And Sayyidina Zayd radiallahu anhu responded to him by saying, I know that he is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So even if what you're saying is true about what you find in the Torah, who cares? If I'm going to be martyred in this battle, who cares? That's part of our role. If we die in the process, again, it's all in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the army was prepared and it started marching towards Asham. And then the Prophet ﷺ went to Jum'ah to give the khutbah of Jum'ah and he saw in the people sitting around Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiallahu anhu. Weren't you nominated as one of the leaders of this, this army? Shouldn't you have already started marching with that army that started marching this morning? And Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Rawaha when the Prophet ﷺ asked him, what kept you behind? He said, I wanted to pray Jum'ah with you, O Messenger وسلم, and then I'm going to catch up with them. And the Prophet ﷺ told him, well, of course attending Jum'ah with me has a great reward, but their early departure for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives much more reward. Whatever you, you do, you cannot catch up with them in the reward. لَغَدْوَةٌ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَوْ رَوْحَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِّنَ الدُّنْيَا وَمَا فِيهَا أو كما قال صلى الله عليه وسلم That going in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the morning or coming back in the, in, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the evening is better than this whole world and whatever it contains. So Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Rawaha immediately prepared himself and rushed to join the army. The army kept traveling for several days until they reached uh, close to their destination and there was a, a, a heavy fog in the area, so they were almost lost on the way. The Prophet ﷺ had told them, do not enter, do not camp, do not settle in the city of Mu'tah for some reason. But again, not knowing the road and being in a heavy fog, they took a wrong detour and they ended up in Mu'tah. And when they recognized that, they said, well, we, we didn't mean to, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meant for us to be there. Now, they were surprised by the army that they're facing. Because when the people of Ghassan, the Ghassasina, the Christian Arabs, allied with the Romans, heard about the approach of this army, they called for the Roman Empire. And Heraclius, the emperor, responded to their call by preparing a huge army. So the total number of the army facing the Muslims, the Muslims were about 3,000. The opposing army was close to 200,000 including 100,000 from the Romans and 100,000 of all the Arab Christian tribes in Asham. That's a huge army. If you look at the numbers, it's not uh, proportional. Again, it's three against 200, which is one to 66. Let's go back to uh, the Battle of Badr. And let's go back to the revelation of Surah Al-Anfal to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Initially, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala made the acceptable ratio 1 to 10. إِنْ يَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ مِئَةٌ صَابِرَةٌ يَغْلِبُوا أَلْفًا مِنَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا So it was 1 to 10. And then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala relieved that. الْآنَ خَفَّفَ اللَّهُ عَنْكُمْ وَعَلِمَ أَنَّ فِيكُمْ ضَعْفَ So the relief came as 1 to 2, the acceptable ratio would be 1 to 2, which means the Muslim army should not retreat if it's facing an enemy that's twice their number. 1 to 2, here we're talking about 1 to 66, which is even more than 
the initial uh, revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before the relief which was 1 to 10. Imagine if one individual was supposed to face 66. That's almost impossible. So when the army of the Muslims in Mu'ta saw that, they recognized we are completely outnumbered. We are fighting on a foreign soil. This is their homeland. They are more settled. They are more rested. They are better prepared. What should we do? If we retreat, we have an authorization by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that the ratio can be up to one to two. But now this is impossible. What should we do? So they started consulting. And Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiallahu anhu said, listen, what did we come for? We came following the command of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to avenge the martyrdom of our brother who was killed by our enemy. And in all of our battles, what have we been asking for? Either victory or martyrdom. If we are victorious, which is a long shot, alhamdulillah. If not, we're going to be martyrs, which is a great victory and great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's what took us out of our homeland, seeking one of these two great bounties from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he kept encouraging them until they decided, well, we're going to go for that battle following the commandment of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, this unique battle, you know, there's a difference between a battle ghazwa that was witnessed by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam where he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam led the army and participated in the battle and Sariya, which is an expedition where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam nominated a leader but he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not individually or personally participate in that battle. So the question now is, is Mu'ta a Ghazwa or a Sariya? You're going to find it listed in the books of Sirah sometimes as Ghazwat Mu'ta and sometimes as Sariyat Mu'ta. Of course, Sariya expedition, we would understand that because the Prophet ﷺ was back in Medina and this is in Sham. What about Ghazwa? Here's the reason why some scholars call it Ghazwa. Because the Prophet ﷺ was receiving revelation in real time about what's happening and what is taking place thousands of miles away in Asham. And the Prophet ﷺ was broadcasting these news in real time, live to his companions in Al Madina Al Munawwara, narrating step by step, play by play, the events of what's happening in the battlefield. So, as if he, وسلم, again, through the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as if he وسلم, was physically there, part of that army. That's why, again, some scholars call it Ghazwat Mu'ta. So, Sayyidina Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu took the leadership. And this is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is narrating to his companions. Zayd took the banner, which is the sign of leadership. And he stepped forward. He rushed to the rows of the army of the enemy. He fought bravely. Shaitan came to him, reminding him about life and reminding him about the possibility of retreat and so on. And he rejected that. And he fought bravely until he was martyred, radiallahu anhu. Now the Prophet ﷺ again is narrating that live. And then Ja'far, radiallahu anhu, took the banner as the second nominated leader. He fought with that banner bravely. And when he was surrounded by the enemy, he dismounted his horse and he fought on foot until his two arms were severed radiallahu anhu and he was martyred and then abdullah ibn rawaha took the banner again the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is delivering this news live and he paused sallallahu alayhi wasallam so now the ansar the first two companions sayyidna zayd radiallahu anhu and sayyidna ja'far radiallahu anhu are muhajireen people from mecca Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Rawaha is representing the Ansar and there was always this competition for the good between the Muhajireen and the Ansar. 
Now the leader of the Ansar, the, the representative of the Ansar, the Prophet ﷺ said that he took the banner and then he paused. So they started worrying. What did he do? Did he retreat? Did he surrender? Did he change his mind? And then the Prophet ﷺ continued by saying, and he fought bravely until he was martyred. Radiallahu anhu. Now the Ansar settled because now their leader cannot be less than the leaders of the Muhajireen. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, and then a sword of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the banner and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will support him and give him victory. Now what happened in the battlefield after Sayyidina Zayd radiallahu anhu was martyred, Sayyidina, Sayyidina Ja'far took the banner. After Sayyidina Ja'far radiallahu anhu took the, the banner and was martyred, Sayyidina Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiallahu anhu took the banner and he sort of hesitated because of what he saw he was overwhelmed by the number and uh, being surrounded by the enemy. So he hesitated for a, for a second or paused for a second. That's why the Prophet ﷺ paused. And then he regained his courage and went forward and chanting poetry. لَكِنَّنِي أَسْأَلُ اللَّهَ الرَّحْمَنَ مَغْفِرَةً And he, uh, he basically spoke to his own self. أَقْسَمْتُ يَا نَفْسِي لَتَنْزِلِنَّ لَتَنْزِلِنَّ أَوْ لَتُكْرَهِنَّ قَدْ أَجْلَبَ النَّاسُ وَشَدُّ الرَّنَّ مَا لِي أَرَاكِ تَكْرَهِنَ الْجَنَّةَ يَا نَفْسُ إِلَّا تُقْتَلِي تَمُوتِي هَذِي حِمَامُ الْمَوْتِ قَدْ صَلِيتِي وَمَا تَمَنَّيْتِ فَقَدْ أُعْطِيتِي إِنْ تَفْعَلِي فِعْلَاهُ مَا هُدِيتِي Very, very emotional verses of poetry. He is forcing his own self. He's saying, أَقْسَمْتُ يَا نَفْسِي لَتَنْزِلِنَّ You will be forced to go and fight as your predecessors. لَتَنْزِلِنَّ أَوْ لَتُكْرَهِنَّ I'm going to force you to do that despite your own fear, despite your own uh, hesitation. Why are you running away from paradise? And then he spoke to his own self again. Oh, if you're not going to be killed in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sooner or later you're going to die. And now that you have been exposed to that, this is your chance to gain this virtue from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the martyrdom. What you have been wishing for, now it's available to you that martyrdom. If you do like your predecessors, which are Sayyidina Zayd, Sayyidina Ja'far, you will be guided to the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he fought radiallahu anhu until he was martyred and the banner fell. The falling of the banner in the battlefield usually is a sign of the defeat of the army because again, there's no congregation point. There's no point where the army can, can unite around or a focal point for the army to unite around. One of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Thabit ibn Akram radiallahu anhu, saw the, ba the banner falling and this was a, one of the Muhajireen. Uh, I'm sorry, he was one of the Ansar. He was from uh, uh, al Aws, And when he saw the banner falling, he took the banner, but he didn't know what to do with it. He was not selected as a leader, so he looked around and he saw in the distance Sayyidina Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anhu. So he gave him the banner. Sayyidina Khalid said, you are older in Islam than I am. You are more capable of leading this army, you are more fit or deserving of leading the army that I, than I am. And Sayyidina Zayd told him, I, Thabit told him, I only took the banner to give it to you because you are more capable and you know more about the battlefield than I do. So please take this banner. Sayyidina Khalid radiallahu anhu took the banner and that's when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave him the nickname for the first time, Sayfullah, by narrating the sword of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by narrating to the companions in al Madina al-Munawwara, فأخذ الراية سَيْفٌ مِنْ سُيُوفِ اللَّهِ وَسَيَفْتَحُ اللَّهُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ وَسَيَفْتَحُ اللَّهُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ That a sword of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the banner and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him victory. Now it was almost night time and there was no battle taking place at the night time due to the darkness. So now it was time to reorganize. Sayyidina Khalid radiallahu anhu looked at the army Surprisingly enough, with all of this fighting and all of this blood and so on, many from the army of the enemy were killed. About 12 
the narrators say anywhere between 12 and 20 of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, the army of the Muslims were killed or martyred including the three leaders because they basically formed sort of a circle and tried to protect each other for no one to penetrate through that circle so Sayyidina Khalid radiallahu anhu what he did was again something genius as he was a military genius he re completely revamped and reorganized the army an army in general at these times was composed of five parts al muqaddima the front al muakhira or al saqa the the back the rear which used to carry also the water and and, and to take care of the injured and so on al maymana the right wing al maysara the left wing and al qalb the heart of the army so these were the five components of the army so what Sayyidina Khalid radiallahu anhu did was completely reshuffle these five parts. He took the saqa or the mu'akhira, the rear, and put it in the front. He took the front that took the brunt of the war and put them in the back. He took the right wing and put it in the left, and he put, took the left wing and put it to the right. So the following morning, they had, they had been fighting for almost seven days by that time. The following morning, the army of the Romans looked around and they saw completely new faces, completely new banners. They were used to see the corresponding wing that they were fighting for the previous seven days. So when they saw that, they said, well, this must be a new army. They had more supplies coming from Medina. We are completely exhausted. And this is a new fresh army. We're not going to be able to fight them. So part of that army started retreating and another part starting defending their positions until the major army retreated. And that's when Sayyidina Khalid radiallahu anhu again did a double maneuver, an attack, and at the same time preparing for the rest of the army to start safely retreating without being followed by the outnumbering number of, of the opposing army. So he kept part of that army of the Romans busy until part of the army of the Muslims started retreating gradually towards al madina al munawwara with the safe retreat. And the Prophet wasallam is narrating that in real time. And they managed to kill some of the leaders of that Roman army. And Sayyidina Khalid radiallahu anhu managed to retreat safely with the rest of the army to join the Prophet wasallam in al madina al munawwara Now, according to the narrations of the seerah, there are different, again, different perspectives, different narrations. In the first few days, especially after the Sayyidina Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu was martyred, and it seemed that ultimately the whole army is going to perish, some of the companions who were in that army, including relatively young ones like Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, who was a young companion, they looked at the situation 1 to 66, they understood from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they are allowed to retreat because they are outnumbered. So they retreated before the conclusion of the battle. And they reached al Madina al Munawwara earlier. And at the time, some of the companions looked at them in this disdain. How did you escape? Where is the rest of the army? How did you escape? Especially that the news about the martyrdom of the three leaders was given to them by the Prophet Sallallahu So they started throwing dust in their faces, calling them names, calling them, you're cowards, you're the ones who ran away. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, no, they're not cowards, they did not run away. They rejoined the congregation in al Madina to prepare for another wave. لَيْسُوا بِالْفُرَّارُ وَلَكِنَّهُمُ الْكُرَّارُ إن شاء الله. أنا فئتهم. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala prevents uh, running away from the battlefield except for joining the major ranks and to get more fortifications and renew the uh, offensive. And then the major army led by Sayyidina Khalid radiallahu anhu with some of the gains that they gained after the Roman army retreated started arriving in al Madina al Munawwara. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of course lost two of his closest companions in this battle, Sayyidina Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu and Sayyidina Jafar ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, especially that he hadn't, as we mentioned before, he hadn't seen Sayyidina Jafar for almost 14 years. He enjoyed his companionship for only 
less than a year and now he is martyred so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam called for their children to be brought to him sallallahu alaihi wasallam he sallallahu alaihi wasallam hugged them and made dua for them and especially for sayyidna zaid radiyallahu anhu the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he was narrating the events of the battle said allahumma aghfir li zaid allahumma aghfir li zaid allahumma aghfir li zaid three times Allahumma aghfir li Ja'far ibn Abi Talib Allahumma aghfir li Abdullah li Abdullah ibn Rawaha asking for forgiveness for Sayyidina Ja'far and Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Rawaha once for each so again that was the the these were the events of the expedition of Mu'ta or the battle of Mu'ta and that's why later on close to the end of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam actually the last army commissioned by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the army led by it was army directed again to asham to avenge the martyrdom of sayyidna zaid sayyidna ja'far and sayyidna abdullah ibn rawaha and the other great companions who were martyred there and it was led by none but sayyidna usama ibn zaid radiyallahu anhu who was about 17 years old usama ibn zaid Ibn Haritha, the son of Zayd ibn Haritha, continue the mission of your father. Your father was mur martyred there, he was buried there. The three of these companions were buried in the same grave. And now it's your turn to go and continue the mission of your father. Who was initially supposed to be in this army as soldiers under the leadership of Sayyidina Usama ibn Zayd radiallahu anhu, Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, Sayyidina Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu and all the great companions were supposed to serve under the leadership of Sayyidina Usama ibn Zayd radiallahu anhu. Now, uh, just to mention something about, again, the appearance of Sayyidina Usama ibn Zayd, he looked quite like his father. He was very thin, very light-hearted, smiling quite a lot, with a sense of humor, with a very, very dark skin. At the conclusion of, uh, as we're going to mention later on, the conquest of Mecca, which inshallah we're going to talk about maybe next time of the, or the time after, the Prophet ﷺ, before decamping and going back to Medina, he kept waiting and waiting and waiting for someone because he didn't see that person in his group. And then that someone appeared, and it was none but Sayyidina Usama ibn Zayd radiallahu anhu. Some of the new Muslims coming from Yemen who had this still the racist mentality. Are we waiting for the slave? Is that the one that we are we have been kept forward, been delayed for? This young slave? So that them led them later on, after the Prophet ﷺ passed away, to go back into disbelief after having been Muslim al Ridda. al -ridda. So the apostasy going back into disbelief uh, just because of these racist tendencies that they kept from the days of ignorance before Islam. So inshallah next time we're going to talk about some of the events that happened after the battle of Mu'tah which was uh, again we're talking now about the end of the seventh year the beginning of the eighth year of the Hijrah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so next time, inshallah, we're going to talk about another expedition uh, prior to the conquest of Mecca. And then, inshallah, we're going to talk about the great event, which is the conquest of Mecca that happened in Ramadan of the eighth year of the Hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So until next time, inshallah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.